How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the You Know And I'm Saying podcast, where you get to know a little bit more about people, passions, and all things business. Today, I'm uh, joined by the excellent Kevin Hagen from Thrive Impact, who has been working with CEOs for quite some time now and is super excited. I'm super excited to be interviewing him about his life and the things that he does. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. Glad to be here, Adam. Absolutely. So, Kevin, uh, you know, we'll kind of like touch on multiple different things, but I wanted to kind of like deep dive into one thing first. Yep. Uh, in Thrive Impact, uh, if you can tell me a little bit about that organization. Yeah, sure. So we started Thrive Impact, uh, my business partner and I started Thrive Impact uh, about three and a half, almost four years ago now. Uh, and we decided to start it because what we were seeing happening in the nonprofit space, um, he and I had both been sort of veterans in the nonprofit industry. I had been CEO of several nonprofit organizations. He had been the head of fundraising and development for several organizations. So what we wanted to do is sort of address what we were seeing. And that was really just sort of this burnout that was happening in the nonprofit space um, and largely caused by misalignment, um, misalignment around strategy and fundraising. And we felt like if we could get the right team together, we could tackle some of these sort of systemic issues in organizations that we had seen sort of plague different organizations that we had worked at. Um, so we started Thrive Impact to really address the nonprofit burnout problem. So, so you, you know, there's, there's a bunch to unpack here. So, you know, you talk about this concept of burnout. Um, what were nonprofit, I guess, CEO level people experiencing? And is that across the board? Do you address that as an organization across uh, all levels? Yeah. So, I, I mean, what we were seeing is, first of all, as a CEO of any kind of organization, whether it's a nonprofit, it's a business, uh, small business, large business, it's a pretty lonely job mm. uh, because it's one of those roles that there are some things you can share, there are some things you can't share. So it, that whole proverbial saying, uh, lonely at the top, I yeah. mean, it was really true and I experienced it. And a lot of times in you know business and in nonprofits, there'll be sort of these business round tables or affinity groups. And often you would belong to those and I belong to quite a few of those in my tenure. And what would happen is you wanted to be honest, but you couldn't exactly be honest mm. because in some respects, these were our direct competitors in the nonprofit space. They were CEOs of other international relief and development organizations or other healthcare groups, and you couldn't be fully transparent. So the idea behind Thrive Impact was to build a place where leaders could come, mm -hmm. um, be themselves, find support from an organizational standpoint, but also support from a strategic direction standpoint. Because mm -hmm. often what we were seeing is that it was lack of strategy and sort of organizational alignment around that strategy that was causing so much of the burnout. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the burnout that you experienced uh, during, you know, the, that period of time really led you to, you know, start this organization. And what did you find? What, were, were you expecting to find uh, like a, a business model there? Or like, was it surprising the amount of people that, you know, came to you? H yeah. How did that work out? Well, you know, it was really interesting because in the beginning, like most business, it's very relationship focused, right? So we would get clients coming in the door that were largely connected to one of the two of us who were founding the organization. Uh, word began to spread a little bit around some of our client work and how we were doing uh, things quite differently than a lot of nonprofit uh, coaches or consultants. But what really, I think, changed our trajectory, um, while tragic for the world, was the pandemic. Mm. Uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we decided that we would pivot our business slightly and begin opening up our network very quickly and free of charge to any nonprofit executive uh, who wanted to attend. And we had these weekly, what we call crisis conversations. And we would bring in leading experts. We would do some, but we would have experts on, you know, the federal funding that was coming out or wow. experts on remote work, um, ways to do events mm -hmm. more virtually. And 
I mean, we were able to sort of expand pretty quickly because I think over the course of our crisis conversations, we engaged probably about 150, 200 different wow. nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. uh, because that was a place that people were, I mean, we were just all lost. I mean, and nonprofits typically have a little bit of a lag time uh, when it comes to adoption of technology. So there were many nonprofits who found themselves in a position that they, they were just behind. Well, they were behind and they didn't have remote capabilities. They didn't have Zoom accounts. A lot of them didn't have laptops for their whole staff uh, because they had been very sort of situationally focused in a in their facilities. Uh, so it was just interesting time that I think a lot of organizations struggled and that began to build a pretty tight knit community. Uh, and we did a lot of work virtually where we did breakout groups and people did solution circles to sort of share uh, solutions that they had found to problems that they were facing. And it really built the network in a way that we probably would have taken us years Mm -hmm. to get to that point. So it sped up everything. Yeah, it sped up everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to ask a little bit about kind of like the business model. So yeah. you have these, uh, you, you said you open the door. So is this like a subscription or like some sort of fee that, you know, you pay as a membership to be able to receive the services yeah. of the group? So we actually have a couple of business models. Okay. Potentially operating under the same uh, roof. Uh, <clears throat> so we do traditional client work. Okay. So a client will come in and engage with us uh, in a longer term strategic planning process or a revenue diversification process. And that's very much one-on-one -on -one client work. And we do a lot of coaching through that process, facilitated workshops, and that's at a much bigger price point. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have what we call the Thrivers program, which is our monthly sort of subscription service, as you say, where every Monday afternoon, if you're a member of Thrivers, there's actually an online workshop that you attend. There's usually some content that's shared, and then it's breakout groups with your small group. So mm. you're assigned to an accountability group, and that accountability group will then sort of workshop what issues you may have, give updates on what happened from last week, what actions they were supposed to take, did they take them, what were the outcomes. So it's a little bit of an accountability structure, particularly for CEOs and fundraising, mm -hmm. heads of fundraising groups. So we have both models really. Um, and they feed into one another. Our clients, become, their team will yeah. become part of the monthly program and sometimes the monthly program will become clients. Very nice. So, so, you know, your experience working with CEOs, you said that you were a CEO yourself at one point. You know, yep. the experience there is is very uh, is 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 a mass, right? So, yep. you know, one of the questions that I have is what is something that, you know, uh, makes a great CEO? Well, that's a big question, Adam. <laughs> Sorry. Um <laughs> I have my own philosophy. Sure. Um, so I think there are a couple of things, particularly in today's climate, that makes a really good CEO. Uh, I, I think gone are the days of sort of command and control CEOs that dictate orders down through the chain of command and work gets done. I, I think generationally we've seen a shift with millennials and um even Gen Xers to some extent that didn't necessarily buy into the whole institutional concept. But we've seen these generational shifts and I think in terms of leadership now, it's all about transparency and authenticity. You know, as a CEO, I always tried to be as open and honest as you possibly can. Uh, leading from a point of um, empathy, I think is also really important because people these days particularly on the nonprofit side, they want to buy into a, a mission. You know, they want to have impact, mm. not only in their work, but in their lives. So I think in order to do that, we're sort of in a position where leadership is beginning to change. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be more vulnerable in many respects. And this is one of the things I was talking about COVID when the pandemic hit. You know, we, we were telling these nonprofit CEOs, we were like, just be vulnerable. I mean, tell your teams, I don't know. Mm. We're in unprecedented times. We're figuring it out. This is what I promise you. I promise you I will stay abreast on what's happening. I will 
pull together teams. I'll solicit your input. And when we make a decision, I will tell you. And I would tell people all the time, I was like, if you are trying to instill a sense of confidence in your staff to say, you know what's going to happen and you can manage this, it was like, they're just looking at you knowing that you're lying to them mm -hmm. because we haven't been through this. So Absolutely. nobody knows how we're going to manage this. Um, so I think that vulnerability, authenticity, and transparency is really critical. And if you can get that balance right, it doesn't mean that you don't have to make hard decisions. As a CEO, you get paid to make tough decisions, and sometimes you have to make the call, and you need the team to follow along. Uh, but I think if you've built that relationship in a, in a real way, in an authentic way with your team, they'll, they'll follow. Some words of wisdom right there. I love that. I try. I love that. <laughs> you know, you, you talk about this this style of leadership, and and there's been a, a lot of like um, uh, there's things that are like servant leadership and all these yeah. different concepts. You actually uh, deploy a, a certain style yourself. Um, you know, can you go into that a little bit and, and describe what that is? Well, you know, it's interesting. <sighs> Most of my career, I've had an executive coach mm. as I've led CEO or as I've been the CEO and led organizations. And, and I've used the same executive coach over the years. And, and she's always said that she feels like my, my leadership style is, is very difficult to define, mm. that, that it's a component of a couple. Uh, and she always joked that she was going to write a book about, about, your leadership? about my leadership style one day, <laughs> sort of following me around. Um, so I, I definitely think there's a side of me that would fall under sort of this concept of compassionate leadership. I mean, definitely servant leadership to a, a, an extent as well. But I think sort of this concept of compassionate leadership, which is having a level of compassion around the work that you do and around the team. Mm -hmm. um, and I think often when people think about compassion from a leadership perspective, it's interesting because it sort of sounds a little weak and frou-frou at times. Um, but, but I don't think it has to be, you know, the compassionate side of leadership is actually understanding the dynamics of how an organization works. So it doesn't mean that you tolerate and you give in and you're compassionate to everything that goes on. It, it just means that when that work is done, you do it in a way that ultimately upholds the dignity of the individuals at play. And, and I'll give you sort of two examples. Um, when I was the CEO of Feed the Children, we needed to do sort of a, a global restructuring. And what it meant with some shifts in our programmatic and our business model is that there were gonna be people who didn't end up with jobs. Mm. And it wasn't that the people were bad. Um, it wasn't even that they didn't do a good job. It was just that skill was no longer needed. So having that conversation in a real and honest way, giving people the opportunity to find landing spots um, within the organization, giving them this, the ability to take classes or, or build their skills to do something else, that's very much compassionate. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. Sure. Um, and I think another example of sort of compassionate leadership is that you, you just don't let people languish. Nobody wants to come to work and do a bad job. Mm -hmm. And you inherently know if you're doing a good job or not. I mean, most employees know. Um, so to me, compassionate leadership is just saying, okay, this isn't working. Mm -hmm. um, it, you're not right for this role. You're not right for this mission. Maybe you're not right for this organization where we are at this point in time. And I don't want you to sit here and languish and come to work and be miserable every day. That's right. Uh, knowing that you're not doing a good job because we all want to do a good job and have impact with the work that we do. Um, so I, I think you can make tough calls and send people out the door and do the things that oftentimes as leaders you have to do, but you can do it in a way that ultimately upholds the dignity of the person. And, and still is is compassionate. Yeah. And, and it still kind of like falls within Absolutely. that realm. Um, sh shifting gears a little bit, you know, for, for some of those out there that maybe potentially want to achieve, you know, an executive position, what type of advice would you give to them? Well, you know, it's interesting. People ask me all the time how you became a CEO. And I had sort of a strange route to become a CEO um, because I've worked in the government, I've worked in the private sector, I worked for private equity, I've worked for nonprofits. Um, so it's been 
an, an interesting ride. But the one thing I would definitely say is to be a, a, a great CEO, I think there are two things that ultimately you have to do. You have to know how to understand people and dynamics of organizations. And I think that's critically important. Um, you know, how people interact within teams, how people interact within structures. And I think the second thing is you have to know how to ask exceptional questions mm. because nobody has all the answers. No CEO has all the answers. Um, earlier in my career, I moved around quite a bit within um, actually the postal service. I used to work at the oh, postal service headquarters and I had multiple roles at the postal service at the national level. And um, a very good friend of mine who sort of joked because I moved from labor relations to different HR to some operational things and everyone sort of joked or this particular friend joked, I guess. She's like, well, you know, Kevin, the only thing you're ever going to be qualified to be one day is a CEO <laughs> because you've never been, you've never stayed anywhere long enough to learn like deep expertise oh, that you've been enough places how, to learn a lot. How but long not would you stay at each? I mean, typically maybe two to three years okay. uh, within a particular role within that organization. And but what that does allow you to do is it allows you to learn enough and have a variety and breadth of information that you know, but it's never lost on me. I'm not an expert in human resources, but I sure know enough about HR to ask the right questions mm -hmm. and to understand, you know, what are our risks? Um, have we addressed these risks? So I, I think that ability to ask really probing questions is really important. Yeah. Um, and I think if you can do those two things as a CEO, understand people and dynamics and know how to ask good questions, you can ultimately be successful. That's a great, uh, great formula. Um, so I wanted to actually, you know, learn a little bit about the history. Take me to yeah. young Kevin when you like, where were you, were you, where were you born? So I was born in Statesboro, Georgia. Oh, um, Back here, uh, back yeah. at it again. Yep, I was born uh, right here in Statesboro, Georgia, um, and graduated uh, from Scriven County High School in Sylvania. Uh, went to undergraduate at Mercer University okay. in Macon. Uh, Studying? I actually studied history, political science, and German. I okay. have a triple degree. Um, only have a triple degree because I was an exchange student in okay. Germany when I was in high school and it was so easy to get the German degree. It just made sense to do it. Uh, and left uh, Georgia and went to Washington DC, got my master's in international affairs mm -hmm. uh, at American University up in DC. And then ended up taking a, a temporary gig um, as the interim chief of staff to the CEO of National Geographic. How, how um, did that even come about? Because Reg Murphy was a Mercer alum. Okay. And he would host all the parties for the alumni at uh, National Geographic in DC. Um, and his chief of staff was going out on maternity leave and was like, hey, you know. Did, did he, you know him from before? Or I was did that... not. I just sort of met him at these alumni. At the party? Events. Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I met him, I went and did a temporary gig with him while his chief of staff was out. And um, he was just a really sharp guy. National Geographic at the point was probably one of the two or three largest nonprofits sure. in the world. Um, and he was just a really sharp guy. They were in an interesting time where they were looking at new revenue models and strategies uh, outside of the traditional. And they were thinking about things like starting a television channel. Um, the magazine and, at this point had already been out. Yeah, the magazine was all there was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but that was before Nat Geo. It mm -hmm. was, um, I mean, we even, there were conversations around starting a restaurant chain. I mean, all kinds of things. Um, and that sort of just hooked me. Yeah. You know, because I got to work right next to him uh, as the CEO. And the whole strategy component of the business really sort of enthralled me. Um, but then he ended up retiring. Um, it was a temporary assignment, so I ended up leaving. Um, but he retired, and then I um, left then. And ended up at the Postal Service, uh, helping start a national conflict management program um, 
you may be too young to remember this. I don't know Adam, anything about but, that. Um, <laughs> But the Postal Service had a reputation at one point for being quite a violent place. There was a really a, 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 a phrase in the American lexicon called "going postal." I've, uh, I've heard of that before. So, well, so what 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 caused that? Uh, well, it was just a whole series of instances uh, where postal employees would actually go in and shoot up and kill their co-workers. Oh my um, God. So workplace violence had become a, a pretty prevalent issue, at least in the American psyche when it came to the Postal Service. Um, so how did, I mean, how do you go from Nat Geo to, okay, you are supposed to go in and resolve this Well, problem. you know, it was one of those things because I also went there temporarily um, on, on an assignment. And my background in international affairs was um, with my master's degree is I'd also focused on peace and conflict resolution. So the okay. peace and conflict resolution made a lot of sense. Understood. So I went there, ended up being at the Postal Service uh, for a decade um, and helped launch that program around conflict management. It was the biggest conflict management program in the world. Um, we won a lot of awards. We um, eliminated the, the issues. The issues. Um, I, you know, someone was, I was talking to someone the other day, well, not the other day, it was probably a few months ago, who had never even heard the term going postal. And it just sort of dawned on me. I was like, wow, like we did it. Yeah. Right? Like there's a yeah. whole generation behind me who has no idea what going postal means, uh, which means we successfully resolved, you know, that component. Um, and and, you know, that was a big program and a big staff. We had around 400 people dedicated to that work um, because the Postal Service at that point had around 900,000 employees. Wow. Um, and relatively speaking, if you looked at the demographics of the Postal Service, it, the instances of violence we had was not really that extraordinary because mm -hmm. any city of 900,000 people would have had a lot more. Um, instances of violence but it was just harder because we were a public facing institution sure, nice. everybody goes to the post office mm -hmm. everybody has a letter carrier come to their house every day so we were a very personal connection uh, but we were able to resolve that and i then left there and did um that role within the post service i did two national restructurings with the postal service um, and build a shared service center um, to handle human resources work down in tampa florida and that was really interesting and enlightening. And then I ended my tenure at the Post Service as their um, lead over executive development. So mm -hmm. I was their manager for executive development, which was really focused on training the next generation of uh, postal executives um, to compete in a changing environment. environment. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was a r radically changing environment at that point. And then when I left there, I went to US Foods, uh, which I know you know a little bit about US Foods. That's right. Um, I went to U.S. Foods originally to be their director of ethics and training. Was, was um, there some like violence that was happening at U.S. Foods that caused you to get pulled no, over? No, there? there was no violence at U.S. <laughs> Food. Um, one of actually one of my uh, former mentors and colleagues actually went to be the chief compliance officer at U.S. Foods. Okay, um, and lured me uh -huh. to come with okay. her, <laughs> and um, and I actually went to be their director of ethics and training. And uh, that was uh, short-lived. Uh, that was right after U.S. Foods had a near-billion-dollar accounting scandal. I, um, I knew so I our, about this. Our parent company sort of cleaned house and brought in a whole new team. We were part of that new team. And it was, you know, literally, I don't even think I had the director of ethics and training job maybe five months at uh -huh. that point. Uh, and our entire comms and public affairs staff was fired. And I just got a call that's like, hey, Kevin, we want you to be the head of public affairs and communications. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, uh, that's a interesting challenge um, with no staff. So we had to rebuild the staff. And um, so they switched you in, in mid midstream. Yeah, so I just switched roles. Um, uh -huh. And uh, that was a great learning experience for me. So I was at US Food for a while. Um, they relocated our headquarters to Chicago, and I, I commuted back and forth for a while. And then um, 
a colleague of mine sort of lured me away to go to the nonprofit side. Mm -hmm. And I went to be the chief operating officer of an organization right outside of Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia, called uh, Good360, mm -hmm. which works with about half of the Fortune 500 to do product philanthropy. So, wow. you know, we would take product from major retailers and then manage the logistics side of it and deliver it to charities all across the country. So that got me in the nonprofit side. And I've just sort of been here ever since. Yeah. Um, after that, went to be the CEO of Feed the Children, the global humanitarian group. Uh, stayed there and helped sort of transition some of their work to new programmatic models. Went to be the CEO of the American Diabetes Association and um, was there for several years. And then decided to take a break because that was a lot of sort of transformational kinds of work and a lot, a lot of hours every week. And uh, I wanted to take a year off and I almost made it a year. And then this opportunity to start Thrive Impact came and decided to go there mm. and so, go down that path. So, you know, in all of this, in this immense, I guess, portfolio of things that you have accomplished, um, you know, what, what has been the thing that has stood out to you that you are the most proud of? Wow, that's a great question. Um, there's two things I'm really proud of. Um, I, th I think the first one is that I have really been able, particularly on the nonprofit side, to get people to focus on impact in a way that they have not previously thought. Lots of nonprofits in particular will track activities. Like we helped this many people, we did this many events, we raised this much money. But to me, the importance isn't necessarily the programmatic work. It's the, the impact that it has on the life of the person that we're serving. So, you know, how did it change their life? Um, did it give them three extra years on earth with their grandchildren? Did it, you know, um, resolve a health issue? Did it help them find a job mm -hmm. so they could support their family? So I've been very focused on impact versus sort of the transactional side of nonprofit work. So I think that's one thing I'm very proud of is sort of this lens towards impact that I've been able to bring to organizations. And then I would say the other thing and this is the thing I'm probably the most proud of, is that I have been able to work with some exceptional people. And to me, developing people and teams is really important. And I now have probably, I think, six or seven people at last count who have worked for me directly as my direct reports, who are now CEOs of organizations. And I love that. Like, I absolutely love it. And I probably have another 10 or 15 who've worked for me who are either C-levels or like E executive vice presidents at other organizations. So that aspect of developing and, and seeing people progress throughout their career, I think is really important to me. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of. Here, here's something. So are you able to like, tell within like an interaction whether or not this person has the ability to reach that level? I don't know that it's within a single interaction, mm -hmm. but I think you get a sense of people pretty quickly when you work alongside of them, um, who's committed and who wants to do more. And the people to me who are always going to be the ones that can move up and be successful are the ones that um, are hungry. Mm -hmm. um, if their answer is, well, I've just never done it that way before, or that's not how we do it, those almost never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but really the people who are constantly curious, constantly trying to figure out, you know, what's next for me, what's next for the organization, what programmatically comes next, um, what product wise comes next. Those are the people that I think ultimately will be successful. And I think those two things combined, if I can go to my grave and there's been a good solid core of people who are leading in the nonprofit space in particular, since that's where I've dedicated so much of my life, I think that that's a valuable testament. And I would also say just that sort of view towards impact and getting more people focused on the ultimate impact that they're having. Those are the things I'm most proud of. I think that's huge. You know, having having that type of ability to see people grow yep. and, and kind of like be able to be a part of their journey is, is huge. Um, you know, for, for you, 
what is kind of like on the horizon? Like what, what, what's next for you and, and, and the people that work with you? Well, you know, I think what's next, um, particularly on the, the Thrive Impact side, is we really are trying very hard to build a national community of nonprofit leaders that can be there to support one another mm -hmm. um, and see each other through those difficult challenges and really begin to understand their organizations in a new way and align their strategy and their people and their operations in order to achieve that. Um, you know, one of the things that we've said a lot on the Thrive Impact side is when something goes wrong, blame the process, not the person, mm. because typically we immediately jump to blaming the person. So and so did this wrong or so and so didn't do their job. Um, and normally it's a process problem. So if you can blame the process first and figure out what broke down in the process, then you're able to more effectively address things. And I think systemically nonprofits, even businesses, I don't think are actually very good at that. We, we sort of rush to judgment That's right. as opposed to pausing and trying to really understand, you know, what's going on in our process structure and are there ways we can better orient. And I, and I think if we can do that, and align strategy and operations in organizations, we, we get rid of a lot of the problems and we get rid of a lot of the burnout. The, the methodology that you take, I mean, where, where can people learn more about that? Do you have a book? Is there a book on the way? Well, we don't have a book. Um, there have been a lot of people who wanted me to write a book, but I'm not a writer. Um, so I'll talk a lot on podcasts <laughs> and, but, but I would say, I mean, you can learn more sort of about our methodology at thriveimpact.org mm -hmm. online. Um, we, we do use a model around depreciative inquiry um, in a lot of our facilitated work or in all of our facilitated work, actually, um, which helps sort of discover the best of who you are and, and figure out how to get you to a point of excellence. Mm. Um, and this is called, what is this called, this methodology? It, uh, appreciative inquiry. Okay. Um, and, and we have a fair amount on our website, and then you can also Google it. I mean, it's a, it, it's a methodology that's been around for a couple of decades, but I think it's beginning to gain a lot more traction now uh, because it, it is very much a crowdsourced wisdom kind mm -hmm. of idea. Um, and I think it just goes, as we were talking about leadership styles earlier, it goes to sort of this whole... Um, concept of leadership where you don't have to have all the answers. Like you can be authentic and more transparent and you can collectively ask the right questions mm -hmm. of your team and and sort of solicit great crowdsourced ideas. Kevin, uh, I wanted to first appreciate you for the amount of time that you spent with us. I know that you're extremely busy, always oh, on the phone. And my everything. pleasure. Uh, is there If there's one more thing that you wanted to maybe tell the audience, uh, you know, some advice, a, a piece of wisdom that you've learned over this period of time oh that goodness. you have, um, what would that be? I mean, I would say from a leadership perspective, if you can come to terms with yourself on what you're really good at and what you're not good at mm. and understand that you don't have to be good at everything. I mean, that's why you have teams uh, to supplement the gaps in your own skill. <laughs> that's right. Um, but if, if you know what you're good at and you know how to ask the right questions, then really your opportunities are limitless um, because it really is about knowing your parameters and knowing how to fill the gaps, like I said, around you with the right kind of people from a leadership perspective. And if, and if you do that and, and you're open and honest and transparent and authentic and you're not threatened by the people around you, um, then I think you can be an exceptional leader. I think you can be a really content leader um, because Oftentimes, I know from a leadership perspective, you just constantly want more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And and I think we just live in a world that you don't have to have all the answers anymore. Um, and if you're just practically know that and, and sort of live into it, it, it's a much more fulfilling way to lead an organization. Mm. Um, and I also think people come along a whole lot faster. Because if they feel like they're invested in it, 
um, and they can put their ideas and their wisdom into your work, then the implementation of that work is just going to go so much smoother. I love it. Kevin, I wanted to thank you again for spending some time oh, my with pleasure. us. Uh, thank you for taking care of the whole going postal situation that <laughs> has hey, occurred. My, but... my pleasure. It, it only took a 400 people, you know, a decade. But, but yeah, uh, I'm, 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 super, I'm super thrilled to kind of be able to speak with you. Um, thank you so, so much for sharing uh, your oh, experience pleasure. and everything. So, uh, But that's the show. I appreciate right. it. Great being with you, Adam. Hey, thanks. Cheers. Take care.